Hello and welcome to Byju's IAS presenting to you the daily quiz for 4th of August 2021. Let us begin and have a look at the first question for today. Which of the given statements with respect to project Chaman is or are correct? It is a pioneer project to provide strategic development to the horticulture sector in order to increase farmers income. Crops such as rice, wheat, mustard and jute are assessed under Chaman project using remote sensing technology and satellites. What is the context? This article in the PIB on the use of modern technology for crop production forecasting has a mention of two projects that is FASAL and Chaman. The FASAL scheme that stands for forecasting agricultural output using space agrometeorology and land-based observations is used for crop production forecasting of field crops, while Chaman is used for crop production forecasting of horticulture crops. And Chaman stands for Coordinated Horticulture Assessment and Management using Geoinformatics. Both these projects make use of technology in agriculture to implement precision agriculture. So 9 crops are assessed under FASAL and 7 crops under Chaman project. The crops assessed under FASIL are field crops and they are rice, wheat, tur, rabi pulses, rape seed, mustard, rabi jover, cotton, jute and sugarcane. And the seven crops that are assessed under Chaman are horticulture crops such as potato, onion, tomato, chili, mango, banana and citrus. Chaman project makes use of geographical information system that is GIS tools along with remote sensing data for generation of action plans for horticultural development. It will help in assessing crop conditions, the disease assessment and also follow precision farming. So this would help both the farmers as well as the policy makers in the government. And this is for the strategic development of horticultural segment and consequently to increase the farmers income. So now let us go back to the question. Project Chaman was launched with the aim of helping horticulture segment and also to increase farmers income. Therefore statement 1 becomes correct. Statement number 2 becomes incorrect because under the Chaman project horticulture crops are assessed and these are field crops that are assessed under the fossil scheme. Therefore the right answer to this question would be option A1 only. Now let us move on to question number 2. Which of the given statements is or are incorrect? Battle of Polilur and Battle of Porto Novo were fought as a part of the Third Anglo-Mysore War. As per the Treaty of Mangalore signed after the Third Anglo-Mysore War, Tipu Sultan had to surrender two of his sons as surety to the British till he paid his due. Mysore entered into a subsidiary alliance with the British after the Third Anglo-Mysore War. What is the context? There is an article in the Hindu newspaper today that talks about the controversy over Tipu Sultan's statue that has sparked fire in the state of Andhra Pradesh and hence this question. All the four Anglo-Mysore wars are important for our exam. The treaties that were signed at the end of these wars as well as the conditions in these treaties. Now let us go back to the question. Statement number 1 is incorrect because both these battles that is the battle of Polilur as well as the battle of Porto Novo were fought as a part of the second Anglo-Mysore war and the second Anglo-Mysore war took place between 1780 and 1784. This is the war that ended with the Treaty of Mangalore. Hyder Ali of Mysore clashed with the British East India Company's forces at the battle of Polilur as well as the battle of Porto Novo. Please take note that both these battles were fought in 1781. As a result of the Third Anglo-Mysore War, Tipu had to cede half of his kingdom to the English, he had to pay a war indemnity and Tipu Sultan also had to surrender two of his sons as surety to the British until he finished paying his dues. But all of these were terms of the Treaty of Srirangapatnam or Seringapatnam and not of Treaty of Mangalore. Therefore, statement 2 becomes incorrect. Statement number 3 is again incorrect because Mysore entered into subsidiary alliance with the British after the 4th Anglo-Mysore War. Therefore, the right answer to this question would be option C as the question asks us for incorrect statements. Now, let us move on to question number 3. Consider the following statements with respect to Saubhagya scheme. The scheme was launched to provide free electricity to all households, both APL and poor families in rural areas and poor families in urban areas. Rural Electrification Corporation is the nodal agency for the scheme. 
Beneficiary households for free electricity connections under the scheme are identified using socio-economic caste census 2011 data. Which of the given statements is or are incorrect? What is the context? This article in the Indian Express newspaper talks about what India must do to ensure smooth energy transition towards expanding the use of renewable energy. As it talks about the strategies to help India achieve its energy transformation, there is a mention of the Saubhagya scheme. Therefore, this question. Let us discuss this scheme in detail as we answer the question. The Pradhan Mantri Sahaj Bijli Har Ghar Yojana or the Saubhagya scheme was launched in September 2017. Under this scheme, free electricity connections to all the households, both APL and poor families in the rural areas, and poor families in urban areas will be provided. Statement number one becomes incorrect because the statement reads the scheme was launched to provide free electricity, whereas the scheme was launched to provide free electricity connections under this scheme. Please remember that there is no provision in the scheme to provide free power or free electricity to any category of consumers. The consumers will have to pay the cost of electricity consumption as per the tariffs of the DISCOMs. And these tariffs will be based on metered consumption. Now taking up statement number two, Rural Electrification Corporation is the nodal agency for the scheme, correct? So who are eligible for free electricity connections under this scheme? The households in rural as well as urban areas will be identified using the SECC 2011 data, which is the socio-economic caste census of 2011. Therefore, statement number three becomes correct. Also remember that all those houses that are not covered under SECC 2011 data but remain unelectrified, they will also be provided electricity connections. But they will have to bear a cost of rupees 500, which the DISCOMs will recover from them in 10 installments through the electricity bill. So the right answer to this question would be option A1 only since the question is asking us for incorrect statement. If we have to discuss the objectives of this Saubhagya scheme, the objective of the schemes are to reduce dependence on kerosene. Kerosene is generally used in poor households for lighting purposes. And through electrification of rural and urban households, the dependence on kerosene for lighting will go down. The scheme also aims at improving educational and health services and also to help people get more and more employment opportunities. And through electrification of households, there will be an increase in economic activity as well. So this is also one of the objectives. Now let us take up question number four. Which among the following are applications of coir geotextiles? Number one, rainwater harvesting. Number two, promoting quick vegetation. Number three, improvement of subgrade soil strength in road pavements. Number four, stabilization of side slopes to check soil erosion. Number 5. Construction of roads. Why have we taken this question? This article in the PIB talks about the coir geotextiles in construction of roads under the Pradhan Mantri Gram Sadak Yojana as well as its other applications. Coir is a natural fibre that is obtained from coconut husk. Coir geotextile is a natural textile fibre that is used in various geotechnical, civil engineering and soil conservation applications. This coir geotextile is naturally resistant to moulds, moisture as well as rot. This is also free from any microbial attack and therefore no chemical treatment is needed. It also has high durability, it is permeable, natural and a strong fabric and hence it has various applications. Let us look at its applications that are given in our question. Can it be used for rainwater harvesting? Yes. The gullies are plugged in using coir geotextiles for improving the percolation of water to the ground as shown in this image. So number one would be correct. They provide protection to the soil from beneath until the roots develop and it also provides permanent vegetation and also promotes quick vegetation. Therefore statement two is also right. Like we discussed, there are several civil engineering applications to coir geotextiles and improvement of subgrade soil strength in road pavements is one such. When the coir geotextiles are used on the slopes, it checks soil erosion. Therefore, statement number four is also correct. Finally, in the construction of roads also is an application of coir geotextiles because it is also being used for the construction of roads under the Pradhan Mantri Gram Sadak Yojana. 
So the right answer to this question would be option D, 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. Now let us take up a previous year question from prelims paper 2016. Consider the following pairs, that is community sometimes mentioned in the news and in the affairs of. Number 1, Kurd, Bangladesh. Number 2, Madesi, Nepal. Number 3, Rohingya, Myanmar. Which of the pairs given above is or are correctly matched? The Kurds are Iranian ethnic group that are native to southeastern Turkey, northwestern Iran, northern Iran and northern Syria. So number 1 is incorrect. It was year 2015 and there was a blockade at the India-Nepal border. This severely affected Nepal and its economy. And this blockade was by the Madesis. And this is how Madesis were in news. Therefore, this is correct. Now coming to Rohingyas. We frequently see in news about the Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar. Therefore, number 3 is also correct. So the right answer to this question would be option C, 2 and 3 only. Now let us take up the fact of the day which is Pradhan Mantri Matsya Sampada Yojana. What is the context? The Government of India notified the National Policy on Marine Fisheries 2017 for the development of marine living resources in India's exclusive economic zone. And in this context, this article in the PIB talks about the Pradhan Mantri Matsya Sampada Yojana. This scheme is a flagship scheme of the Department of Fisheries under the Ministry of Fisheries, Animal Husbandry and Dairying. The Matsya Sampada Yojana is a scheme to bring about blue revolution through sustainable and responsible development of fisheries sector in India. The estimated investment in this scheme is Rs 20,050 crore for a period of 5 years that is from financial year 2020 and 21 to 2024 and 25. So this scheme has two components and that is central sector scheme and centrally sponsored scheme. Under the central sector scheme, the entire project cost will be borne by the central government that is through 100% central funding. And the centrally sponsored scheme is divided as non-beneficiary oriented and beneficiary oriented activities. And this is divided into three heads that is enhancement of production and productivity, infrastructure and post-harvest management, and fisheries management and regulatory framework. For enhancing the production and productivity, under this scheme, financial support is provided during fishing ban or lean period. That is the period during which fishermen cannot go out fishing. They are provided livelihood as well as nutritional support so that the traditional fishermen's family that are socio-economically backward do not suffer and this would help in conservation of fishing resources. Under this component, the government's financial assistance is Rs 3000 per enrolled fisher which is shared in the ratio of 50 is to 50 between the centre and the states and 80 is to 20 between centre and the northeastern and Himalayan states and 100% central assistance is provided to union territories. Besides this, the beneficiary contributes Rs 1,500 on an annual basis, so the total amount of Rs 4,500 is annually paid back to them during the lean period by the respective states or union territories at the rate of Rs 1,500 per month. So what are the other welfare activities covered under the infrastructure and post-harvest management and fisheries management? Number 1. Insurance cover is provided to fish farmers as well as for fishing vessels. Number 2. Livelihood support and nutritional support for socio-economically backward, active traditional fishers is provided during the lean period or the fishing ban period which we already discussed. The efforts are also taken for modernizing the fishing activities, that is the use of technology in fishing. Like, potential fishing zone devices are provided for motorized boats. Boats and nets are also supplied to fishermen. And support is given for technological advancement in the vessels that the fishermen carry for fishing. This is to ensure that these farmers do not go without gainful employment during the lean period. The other welfare activity that is covered under the scheme is to support alternative gainful employment opportunities to coastal communities. That is through open sea cage culture, ornamental fisheries or seaweed cultivation. Number five is development of integrated modern fishing villages. This will ensure smooth operation of fishing activities. Also note that for infrastructural and post-harvest management, fishing harbours, landing centres, cold chain facilities as well as transport vehicles are being developed under the scheme. 
The scheme also helps farmers in marketing their produce. So the primary objective of all these welfare activities that are carried out through this scheme that are divided into three different heads is to ensure that the farmers have good financial returns. So the aim of Pradhan Mantri Matsya Sampada Yojana is to provide social, physical and economic security to all the fishers and fish workers. That is all for today. Thank you for being with us. Keep watching and keep learning.